Yeah. Hi, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch Independence Studio of Lambeer. Uh, before we get started, I have some questions for you, actually. Uh, first, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah good. Uh, second, how many of you here are students, high schoolers? How many of you? Oh, okay. How many of you are independent developers right now? How many of you are AAA developers? Okay. What is the rest doing here? <laughs> what are the teachers? Yeah? Okay. Good. Good. I'm glad you're all here. Um, so here's the thing. I've, um, I'm, I'm a game developer. I travel the world um, continuously uh, meeting developers everywhere and sort of like trying to figure out how I can help, where I can help. Uh, so besides doing game development, I'm also an industry ambassador. Um, and one of the things I've come to realize traveling around the world is that one of the biggest challenges you have if you're entering the industry or you're young in the industry is that there's a lot of stuff you don't know you don't know. Yes, that's correct. Um, it turns out that even with, uh, for me now, a decade in the industry, uh, meeting people everywhere, there's just every time I go somewhere, I learn something new that I didn't know about. And I decided that one way to kind of help combat that is to just do a talk where I go through every letter of the alphabet. And for every letter of the alphabet, I'll talk about a term that I think is important or relevant or interesting. Does that sound good? So we'll start with the A, accessible player experiences, or APX is a relatively new phrase. It was introduced by the people at Able Gamers. And Able Gamers is a charity uh, that I have to be on the advisory board of, a full disclaimer. Um, the idea of APX is that a lot of people, when they think about accessibility in games, they look at it the wrong way around. They think of it as an effort you have to make, and then certain people can now enjoy the game. The reality of accessibility is that the more accessible your game is, the more accessible your game is. It doesn't open it to specific people. It opens it more to everybody, right? So APX is a way in which they've codified dozens of ways to make your game more accessible. Not just because certain people will be able to play it, but because everybody will be able to enjoy it more. In other words, these are 20 plus ways to make your game better. And it's an incredibly simple list. Some of it makes total sense. Like if you have a piece of feedback in your game, make sure it doesn't go over just one sensory input. So you have something that needs to feel powerful, don't just have a powerful sound but not the visuals to go with it, not the haptic feedback or the rumble to go with it. So um, instead of that, make sure you go across as many sensory inputs as possible. So if you have something that needs to feel powerful, make sure it sounds powerful, it has like a good like sound to it, but also looks powerful. So like that doesn't look powerful, it just looks like me stamping on the floor. But if you put like a good particle effect there, if you could do that in real life, it also looks powerful. And if all of your seats would rumble when I did that, it would also feel powerful, right? APX is that. You can find everything about APX at accessible.games. That's the URL. Uh, make sure to look that up. For be a business case, how many of you have ever written a business case? Oh boy. Okay. So in this industry, you will need money. If you don't have money, you will presumably die. Um, the way you get money is by convincing people to give you money, whether that is a consumer or another business. In the case you're trying to get a business to give you money, you're gonna write this document called a business case. And the official definition of a business case, straight from Wikipedia, is a justification for a proposed project or undertaking on the basis of its expected commercial benefit. Now the important part is that you're talking about the expected commercial benefit. And that's not your commercial benefit, it's the commercial benefit of the people that are gonna be giving you money. How much money are they gonna make? So as a student, it's really easy to think, you know what, I need $400 a month to survive. So if I'm gonna budget, I'm just you know, gonna budget that at $400 a month. Now if I'm a publisher and I'm looking at your game, how many of you are working on a game right now? Just raise your hand real quick. There's gonna be so much fewer by the end of this talk, it's gonna be great. Uh, just keep your hand up for a second. So, uh, you, right there, with the, yep, you. Uh, how many people are working on the game? Just you, perfect. How long have you been working on it? 
Two months? How long are you, are you gonna be working on it? One more month. What is the cost of this project in dollars? How, how expensive are you a month? Are you? <laughs> so how much, how much what, what jobs do you do on this project? You're the programmer? The artist? Musician, project lead, designer, marketing. How many salaries is that? How many did you count? It's about five, right? It's about five people. How much money do you think those people make a month on average? That's just, I don't know how much that is in the US, but let's just say a few thousand, right? Now that's a monthly salary, times five, times four months, how many tens of thousand dollars is that, you think? Several tens of thousands, even by quick math. That's the value of your project. That's just your base value. Then the other end is the commercial value. If this game is good and you sell it to somebody, they're gonna make a lot of money. So if somebody came up to you and said like, I wanna buy this game off of you. And they say, I will give you $10,000. That sounds like a good deal, right? Is it? No. Does it mean you shouldn't take it? Also no, right? Like we're in a place right now, <laughs> if you're a student, the first game I did was $10,000. I sold it for $10,000, I had no money. I dropped out of school, don't do that. Um, somebody gave me $10,000 for a game, I took it. Like yes, absolutely. Was it a good deal? Absolutely not. Did it help start my career? Yeah. But just be aware that the value of your game is much higher than you might think. When you say zero, you're saying zero because it doesn't cost you anything, which is true. At the same time, that costs you opportunity. Cost you time, you could have spent on something else, and you are doing five people's job. So if somebody asks you how much money is this game worth, you can calculate that. If you're making a game and you have to write a business case, never put zero in a budget. They're gonna ask you to give a budget, you calculate full price for every person on your team, every job on your team. Because if I'm a publisher and I come to you and I say, that's an incredible game, that's awesome, I would like to buy that game from you. How much is it? And you go, it's $10,000. We're gonna go, oh God, this person has no idea what the hell they're doing. $10,000? I've, I've come across pitches where people are like, yeah, we have two years left on this project. We need 30 grand. <laughs> what? Like if you, if you can't calculate how much two years of work is, then I don't wanna invest in your game because clearly you have no idea what money is. So take this seriously. When you do a budget, calculate budget. Calculate yourself, calculate each job, calculate the money. And then when you're done, when you figure out how much your game is, add 30%. Why? Because fuck them. <laughs> Take the money, why not? So, communication. I have to keep going, otherwise I'm gonna run out of time. So here's a fun exercise to do with students a lot. I'm gonna say a word, and I want you to say the first word that comes to mind, okay? It has to be related to the word, that's all. So I like to use a very simple example, the sun, which we can't see in this beautiful room with no windows. The sun, burning ball of lava in the sky, okay? You, give me a word. Moon, how many people had moon? Raise your hand. Five-ish, okay. Uh, you, yep. There's nobody behind you, it has to be you. You had moon? Four. Uh, yeah. Sorry? Hot. We had five people who picked moon, I picked three of them. <laughs> All right, also five or six. Uh, yeah, G George, why not? <laughs> I need to wake up. Okay, yeah, you. Bright. Okay, who are things they have a word that has, that has more than 20 people in this room? I'm, I'm thinking there's about 100 of us in here, so like a fifth of the room. Anybody thinks they have a word that has a fifth of the room? A very obvious one? <laughs> the Beatles. No? That was very original. Day. Day. Was one person that day? Pain? No? I think Egypt, nobody has that either. I'm half Egyptian though. Okay, I think this proves the point though. This is a word that we all agree upon and somehow we don't agree about it. 
You would think that like we would all have something in common, that there would be a cultural touchstone between these things that would allow us to agree on what this word is. Now, here's a fun one. I tell students uh, when, when the teachers are silly enough to give me access to their students for multiple days, uh, I tell them to make me a game and it has to be a platformer and they can ask me any question they want for 20 minutes and then at the end they get two days to make the game and they go, okay, so it's a platform. I'm like, it's a platform. What's the goal of the platform? You get to the end of the level. Okay, how do you do that? I'm like, like, like a platform. I was like, oh, but, but do you jump? It's like, yeah, you jump. Do you walk? Yeah, you, you walk. Can you run? Yeah, you can walk. Are there power-ups? Yeah, there's power-ups. What kind of power-ups? Well, there's one that makes you grow. There's one that makes you like shoot things. Uh, what kind of enemies are there? Well, there's enemies, you know, like different types of enemies, but they walk. Uh, some of them jump. And then we, we do have questions like, are there mushrooms? Yes, there's mushrooms. Um, and then what game do they make? Super Mario Bros. And what do I do? I fill all of them because I want Mario 64. <laughs> and did anybody ever ask whether it was a 2D or 3D platformer? No, nobody has done that. I've done this exercise like 20, 30 times and it never happens. There's not a single student who does that. You know why not? Because when you say platformer, you stop thinking. Because you think you understand. And as long as I don't say anything that contradicts that, you're just going to keep thinking that that's what it is. Now, game development is an incredibly multidisciplinary field, and we have lots of people doing different things. Here's my one pro tip for you. Communicate in the language of the person you're talking to. Do you think a musician talks the same way as an artist? They don't. You know how a musician talks? With sound. That's literally their language. How does an artist talk? With visuals. That's their language. How does a programmer talk? With code. That's their language. So if I am not a sound designer and I want to talk to a sound designer, I can do a lot of things. I can say like, oh, I need a little bit more of like, mm, you know? <laughs> and that doesn't mean shit. But I can also go like, you know that explosion is like, it's, it sounds like, and I kind of went like, with a bit more like rumble in it. And they can go like, that's the dumbest way anybody has ever explained that to me, but at least I know what you mean, right? If you talk to an artist and you're really bad at drawing, draw a cow anyway. Draw it, just draw the fucking cow. How hard can it be? If you can't figure it out, just put the word cow over it. It'll work. It'll work much better than any other way. If you're a programmer, use a flowchart. Draw a flowchart. If you want to talk to a programmer, sit down and write out the logic. Communicate with people in their own language because otherwise you're going to be like a team that's making a platformer and after three weeks comes together and go like, oh, it's isometric. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was 2D. Uh, if you think that's an exaggeration, I've seen it happen. This is, has happened in professional teams where after a few weeks they get together for a meeting because they're a remote team and they go like, oh. Who knows the door problem? If you do not know the door problem, this is a very simple slide. There is this designer, she go, uh, she, her name is Liz, Liz England. She wrote an incredible blog post about the problems of adding a door to a video game. Because it turns out there's a lot of questions when you add a door to a video game. Like, what is a door? How does door work? Does the door open in one direction or two directions? What happens if you're on the direction the door opens? Does the door collide when it opens or does it slide open? If it slides open, does it just disappear into the wall? If it turns open and you're stuck between the door and the wall, do you clip out of existence? What happens when the door opens in terms of sound? Do we change the texture? Is there anything with the light model we need to consider? There's a thousand questions that go into a door. She wrote an incredible blog post. Read that blog post. How many of you have ever done an expo? Shown a game at an expo. Was it fun? <laughs> yeah, it isn't. Um, it is terrifying. It will be one of the scariest things you do. And the reason it's one of the scariest things you'll ever do is because nobody there gives a shit about you. Which means it's also the best feedback you will ever get on your game, ever. One of the best pieces of feedback I've ever had on one of my games was a person that walked up, looked at our new game, Ultrabugs, went, is this by the people that made Nuclear Throne? Like, yeah. It's like, it's disappointing. And just kept walking. <laughs> like, okay, well, we need to work on the disappointing part. So we've worked really hard on making sure that it looks as flashy, has the same sort of like punch, the same sort of like feeling as Nuclear Throne. Because clearly that's what people want from us. Uh, and now it doesn't happen anymore. I also think there's just not that many assholes in the world that would do something like that. Um, 
One of the best things you will, will ever gain is sitting next to a person who doesn't know that you made the game and hear them talk to a friend about your game. It'll be one of the best experiences you'll ever have, just hearing somebody else explain your game. So if you ever have an, have an opportunity to show your game in an expo, take it. Just take it, do it. Show your game, bring the best demo build you have, bring the best build you have, bring a build that resets itself, please. Um, <laughs> And then just sit. Who knows Fitz Law? Two people who know human-computer interaction, cool. Fitz Law is what I like to call a simple law. And I call it a simple law because it's simple. So fo fo try and follow me here. If you have a mouse cursor or a touch interface, the closer an object is to the cursor, or the bigger it is, the easier it is to put the cursor on it. That's it, that's the entire law. So it, it's, kind of, it's quite simple. If you have a square that is about the size of your screen and your mouse is right next to it, it'll be really easy to move your mouse on top of it. If you have a single pixel on the other end of the screen and you have to move your mouse over, it's gonna be much harder to move your mouse over. That makes sense, right? Now imagine a Windows computer. Just imagine the desktop. There's a bunch of icons, there's a start bar, there's the wallpaper, there's a window open with some other stuff in there. What is currently the biggest element on the screen? Background. Background? The window that's open? What if I told you it was the start bar, uh, button? <laughs> so why is it the start button? Somebody said something? What does that mean? Why? You can't overshoot it, that's the solution. Have you ever wondered why everything on a computer that's important is on the edge of the screen? It's because your mouse can't leave the screen. Which means that relatively, effectively, it's infinite in size. Try it, try mental, mental exercise. Imagine a mouse anywhere on the screen and you wanna to get to the start button. Can you do it by grabbing your mouse and flinging it off the bottom of your desk? Yes, I mean, if you aim diagonal. If you do it this way, then no, clearly. Uh, if you do it diagonally, yes. If you think about this, you will see this everywhere. You will see it in Destiny. If you wanna use the interface in Destiny and you move your cursor over any object that you, can, uh, that you can select in the UI, you'll find that not only does the element expand, but the cursor slows down, which both of those actions increase the size, the effective size of this object. Fitz law is a simple law. There's millions of these simple laws in human computer interaction, in everyday design, uh, which is a really good book, uh, Design for Everyday Things. Um, find these laws. It doesn't mean you have to keep to them. You can break, break them. Every rule is made to be broken as well. Um, but having these in your head will definitely make you a better designer. Who is working on the game again? Wow, it's like half of the people before. This goes really fast. Uh, can, can you keep your hand up for one second? Who here wants to sell that game at some point? Cool. Uh, you. Yes. Can you pitch your game? Can you pitch your game to me? All right. All right. Anybody else? We'll go. With, we'll go with you. Yeah. Pitch. I mean, I, I, I have limited time, so yes, please. Yeah. All right. Thank you for pitching. Who remembers the name of the game? What was the name of the game? Okay. Uh, what kind of game was it? RPG. Satirical RPG. Satirical RPG. Okay. Um, where can we uh, where where can we play it? What platform? Do you know that or do you think that? I know that. How do you know that? I played it yesterday. All right. <laughs> you didn't hear it in the pitch, though, right? No. All right. That's all I knew. Are there any other questions you might have about this game? I'd like to know if it's available. Is it available? Yeah. 
Out soon? Not sure. All right. Give, give, him, a, give him a round of applause for Peter Chin. Now, you know that pitching is scary? You know, pitching is scarier if there's like an angry yelling dude on the stage. <laughs> it's impressive that anybody would try to do that. Here's the thing, for everybody else who has a game that they might want to pitch, you did a pretty bad pitch in that you didn't do a pitch. There's a big angry yelling guy on the stage right now that can tell you what's wrong with your pitch. And then for every future pitch you do, your pitch would have been better. The reality of game design the reality of being in a creative industry is that everything we do, everything we do is scary. Everything we do is scary because there's no objective measurement for good. There's no objective measurement for right. There's just, we can make something that might or might not resonate. We could do a pitch and then see whether it works. You know what the best thing is about pitching and marketing? Is that if you get do it poorly, but you don't fuck it up, nobody remembers. Because that's what bad marketing is. It's forgettable. Which means that you can try a million times until you get it right. And here's one thing you should absolutely get right. How many of you have ever put a game on Itch or Steam or something like it? How much time did you spend on your screenshots? How much is a lot? I spent three weeks on, on average. I record every 30th frame of gameplay while we're building the game for months until we're done. And as we go, I will start clearing out that folder and keeping, o keeping only the best screenshots. Then when I'm done, when we're done with the game, we have a selection of over 100, we will sit there and yell at each other about which one is right. <laughs> and then put up five. And the reason I take three weeks is because I took two years on this fucking video game. And the people that are going to see this store page are going to take about 12 seconds to dismiss my three years of work. So why would you not take as much time as you need for your screenshots? Why would you not take as much time as you need for your trailer? Why would you not take as much time as you can for those 150 to 200 characters you get to introduce your game on the store? That is some of the most important work you will do in game development. It's not the game. It's getting people to start up your game. That is one of your biggest challenges. It will always be one of your biggest challenges. Spend so, three years of your life depends on this impression, right? Months of your life will depend on that impression. Get that impression right. Get the game listing right. So a video game is an interesting thing. Um, it's kind of a messed up thing, actually. When you think about it, you can basically divide it into four things, and this is based on a model by Raf Koster. Um, it's a human-computer interaction loop. And basically, it comes down to, imagine a plus, okay? And then in one corner, we put the player, okay? Then after the player, the player inputs into the game. The input gets processed in the game itself, and then the output, which is feedback, visual, audio, anything, goes back into the player. Does that make sense? We have the player, the input, the game, the output. Now, the player is not a blank slate. When a player comes into a game, they actually have a lot of expectations. We call that the mental model. So uh, it's very easy to prove that we have that. We're playing a first-person shooter on a controller. What is the shoot button? It's the right trigger. We are playing a platform, we're playing a first person game on PC. What is the jump button? Spacebar. Space if the jump button was J, how many of you would find that fast? <laughs> but you always press every button on the keyboard. <laughs> um, the easiest way to explain how this model works though is much simpler. When you boot up a game, the first thing that shows up is the publisher logo. What do we do with the publisher logo? We press every button on the keyboard until it goes away, right? We usually start with like escape or spacebar. So we press that button. Now if the logo disappears, our mental model updates and goes, ah, good, that button skips the logo. If it doesn't work with spacebar, what do we do? We hit escape, right? And then if that works, we go, ah, right, it's escape. And if it doesn't, we agree that the logo will not 
disappear and we go and grab a drink or something, right? So that's the most basic version of a human computer interaction loop. That loop happens 30, 60 times a second with your player. At every point during your game, they're updating. They're going, okay, if I take a step to the left, then this happens. They put input. Now, when they do the input, does the game update yet? It does. Right after that, right? It processes the input. Does the player see the result of all of their input? No, it only sees what you output, right? That's the only thing that goes back to the player. Now, here's a, here's, here's a question for you. Where does the game actually take place? Is it in the player, the input, the game, or the output? If you had to pick one. Output, input, sorry? Yeah. It happens in the player. It all happens in the player. You know why? Because everything else is bullshit. I have bad news for you. Did you know that every video game you love is fake? <laughs> all of them. Your favorite character, fake. Favorite world, fake. Favorite story, fake. Your high scores mean nothing. They're just a number. You know why they matter? Because you believe them. That's the only reason. If you didn't believe them, they wouldn't work. I can make the most beautiful scene, a Call of Duty game, like missiles launching in the background, all that stuff. And if I'm a player that decides to do this through the room, that's my game right now. It's cool that all that shit is happening, but I'm not looking at that, right? If I make the most epic jump across the chasm and I decide that I want to see if I can clip through the tree in the left, and that's my video game. Do you think a speedrunner is playing the game? They're playing their own game. So if you design a game, you design not for the game that is the game, you design for the game that is in the player's head. You know what that means? It means we can cheat. It means we can lie. It means that we can deceive, as long as the player believes it. So how many people think that players want a fair game? Did you know that nobody wants a fair game? People want a game that feels fair. Very different. So if you have a game in which you have to flip a coin, right? Or let, let, let's take a different example. You have a game, because we have, we have somebody from, from, from some big loot games here. Let's say we have a boss fight, and at the end of the boss fight, there's a 10% drop chance for an item. How often do you have to defeat the boss to get that item? 10? Heard 10? It's zero to infinite. You have no idea. We don't know, that's not how percentages works, right? It's not 10 times 10% means 100%. It's 10 times 10%, which means you could technically do it one billion times and not get the thing. Um, if you flip a coin 100 times, you would expect at some point to get heads. That doesn't mean that it has to happen. You can literally have 100 times where you flip a coin and it will all be tails. We are really bad at probabilities, which is great. But as a game designer, it ain't great. So as a game designer, if you flip heads three times, just flip a tails, people will feel better. <laughs> if you have a 10% drop chance after 10 times, just give the item, whatever. If you have a jump where the code literally says that if you are on the ground, you can jump, but if your feet are here, you can't jump, just give three frames in which you can still jump. Is this fair? No. Are we cheating? Yeah. Are we cheating for the player? Absolutely. Should we do that all the time? Yes. <laughs> Cheat for your player. They'll feel awesome. And we don't have to tell them that they're not, right? <laughs> oh shit, I skipped to the end of the presentation. Did you know there's a button that skips to the end of the presentation? I did not know that. Wow, that's awesome. Anyway, mental model updated. So, there's an old story about a pottery teacher who teaches people how to make pots. Have you heard this story? It's a good story. It goes, the teacher decided to divide the class into two groups, and one group got a year to make a good pot. The other group got to make a pot every week, and then just get it, make a pot as good as they could. Who made the better pots? The people who made a pot every week. And why did they make a better pot? Because they fucked up more often. The people who got to make one pot got to try and think and theorize and figure out how to make the best pot possible, and then at the end, they set the oven to the wrong temperature, which they could have known if they had just tried before and gone like, oh wait, this clay actually needs the oven to be 10 degrees lower. How do you make good video games? 
The exact same way, you fuck up a lot. Why? Because there's no good solutions. There's no good solutions for your game because it's your game and nobody has made it before. So, how do we make games? We don't make games by theorizing up front. Yes, you can think. Yes, you can try and figure things out. But ultimately, the test is always going to be you implement it. Does it mean you have to program it? No, hell no. You can prototype it on paper. You can prototype it in words. You can prototype it by throwing things at a wall. I don't care. Prototype. Make the thing. Try the art style. Test the audio. Write the thing. See how people react. Test. Keep testing. If you are scared of failing, you have to get over that. Because that is our industry. It is failure. It is failing upwards, failing forwards. You keep failing until it works. The only way you can truly fail is by not trying. So stop trying to theorize. Stop trying to argue over this. Just do it. Mike would be proud of me. So juice. You just heard the phrase juice. Juice. So it's actually really interesting that we have Lisa here. Uh, there's a talk um, called Juice It or Lose It. It's a very good talk. Watch it. There's a talk called The Art of Screen Shake by my co-founder. I don't like my co-founder, but I'm recommending you this talk. So you know it's good. Uh, watch that talk. And finally, there's a talk called The Nuance of Screen Shake. Oh, The Nuance of Juice by Lisa Brown, who happens to be here in this room. Watch that talk as well. The base idea of Juice is do, that you want to give additional feedback to the player that they did something right or wrong. So in the example of a platformer, say we have budget to add one really cool effect. What effect in a basic platformer, what thing in a basic platformer would you Juice? Under the character feet when they land. Why landing? Okay. Who would pick something else? The end of the level? Anything else? Jumping? Good. If I would have to pick, I would go with land as well. The reason I would go with land is because jump is a really important verb. It's the verb of the game, right? We jump. The point is that we do that all the time, but you can also fail at the jump. I like rewarding players when they succeed at something. The landing means that you did the jump right. So I would, I would juice the landing. Other people would juice the jump. Some people would juice the walk. I would probably advise against that. But the point is, you want to think about what you want to reward and what you want to emphasize. In Lisa's talk, she very correctly points out that one of the biggest challenges right now a lot of developers have is they watch the first two talks about juicing, and then just juice everything. If you juice everything, you might as well juice nothing. It's about standing out. It's about making something va valued more in the player's imagination. Oh, shit, that reset my timer. Oh, boy. I have no idea how much time I've spent. I'm just going to start 45 minutes from now, I have all the time. Uh, does anybody know the phrase kinesthetics? OK, so if juice is the in-game representation of that, kinesthetics are often used as a phrase to discuss the real life feel of things. In other words, how does it feel to hit this button? How does it feel to pull this trigger? How does it feel to push this stick? Um, there's a reason why jump on spacebar makes a lot of sense. It's a big ass button, feels pretty strong, right? There's a reason why a trigger is for the gun because it feels like a trigger. There's a reason why it makes sense to put acceleration on a trigger because it's variable. You can input a little or more. There's a reason why pushing the stick for sprint makes sense because it actually kind of locks your thumb makes it a little bit harder to move, right? There's a lot of reasons to put something on a certain button or a certain input. There's a lot of reasons to have a certain feeling to how you tap a button or how you move a button. That is also part of game design. So don't just think about how things feel in the game. Think about how things feel when you press them. If you have a combination of buttons that is just an ungodly combination of four fingers, that's probably not what you want for something you want to do a lot. But if you're making a game about getting your fingers all tangled up, it's a pretty good idea. It's probably something you would make, actually. I'm a little scared of that. Um, I have a fun challenge for all of you for the next one. You've all made a game. How many of your games featured text? 
My challenge to you is localize your game in German. Yeah, localize it to German. And the reason I picked German is because German will teach you a lot about localization. German is one of the most um, character <laughs> heavy uh, languages in the world in that every word that takes three letters to write in English will probably take like 27 in German. I don't know why this is, but if you have ever worked with localization, you will find that German is one of those languages that is just like four times as wide as any language that you're using otherwise. So my challenge to you is localize your game in English. The reason for that is it will teach you why your UI sucks, it will teach you why your writing sucks, it will teach you why every interface you've ever built sucks, and it will teach you that really you shouldn't position things absolutely, you should probably figure out what the string length is before you place someone, right? So if you want an extra fun challenge, also localize to Arabic. Because it's a completely different alphabet, doesn't use the same letters, and it's right to left, instead of left to right. If you ever want to be really good at making a game, if you ever want to get really good at finishing a game, which is a completely different skill set from starting a game, try this one. If you have three things that you need to make a game, one of them is money, one of them is knowledge, and one of them is motivation, and you lose one, assume you lose your money. You have the knowledge and you have the motivation to make a game. Can you make a game? Yes. You'll have to do it in your spare hours. You have to do it slowly, but you can do it. If you have money and you have motivation to make a game, can you make a game? Yeah, you can just hire people that have the knowledge. You have all the money in the world and you have all the knowledge in the world, but you're not motivated. Will you make a game? No. Why not? Because you won't give a shit. There's one thing in the industry that's more valuable than anything else, and it's motivation. It doesn't mean that you always need motivation, because hell no, I'm not always motivated. I wake up sometimes and I go like, ah, oh, fuck, I have to work on my video game again. But then discipline takes over. I keep working, because I want to get the work done, right? There's one way you can lose your motivation faster than anything else, and it's burning out. And I can tell you, because I've done it. 2013, you're working on a game called Ridiculous Fishing, and for the past three years, we've been working day in, day out, late. And we were proud of that. We were so proud of that. We work until the last train home and we wouldn't miss it. And it was awesome. It was great. Working on the game day in, day out. And that ridiculous fishing got closed. And it was the first bad thing that happened to me and my co-founder in the history of Lambier. And I was hurt. I was scared. Somebody just cloned our game. They were going to get all the money for this game that we've been working on for months. And I opened my computer the next day to start working. And the cursor blinked on my screen. And I got a headache. Not a small headache, like burst, burst my skull open headache, just from staring at a cursor. And I thought, well, it was a stressful day. I'll go back tomorrow. We'll try tomorrow. And it wasn't better. And the next day, it wasn't better. And I haven't made a game since I was six years old. Not well. But since I was six, I wanted to be a game developer. And I was 22. And I was there. I'd done it at a game studio. I'd released Super Crate Box. I'd released Gum Gods. We're working on Ridiculous Fishing, which was ultimately going to be an Apple Game of the Year winning game. Apple Design Award winning game. We've been impressed. We've been to Hollywood for awards. It's a game that defined our studio, that turned us from struggling into established developers. And it almost didn't happen. It almost didn't happen because we broke ourselves getting to that point. And the reality is, we would have gone there without doing that. Looking back, we didn't need that. We just thought it was cool. But we were working half speed because we were tired all the time, exhausted all the time. We were in focus. We were making stupid mistakes all the time. And here I was sitting, almost there, almost at that game, and it almost didn't happen. And you know why I stand here today? I stand here because a studio in Canada named Halfbot, they heard the story of our game getting cloned, and their game had been cloned before. And they offered to port Super Crate Box to iOS for us. That game made just enough money to give us time to recover by not working at all. Six months would have killed my studio, would have killed my career. I can guarantee you that if I had not recovered from that, from the point I was six to the point I was 23, that would have been my full games industry career. And everything that happened after that, Ridiculous Fishing, iOS Award, Apple Design Award, Getting a sustainable studio, Super Crate Box, uh, sorry, Nuclear Throne, Luftrausers, all those games would not have happened. I would not be here today. 
So when I tell you that motivation is the most important thing that you have, I mean it. I know you have teachers here that tell you to work hard, and I agree with that, work hard. If anybody ever tells you you need to work too hard, fuck them. I don't care whether you're your teacher, I don't care whether they're your boss, I don't care whether they're the dean of whatever, I don't care, I don't care. Not a single game ever is worth its developer. Because that developer has more games in the future, has more stuff in the future that they can make. And I don't want to lose any of you to crunch. So if anybody ever tells you you have to crunch because that's how the industry works, that's how the industry used to work. In our future, it won't work that way. This is our industry, we define it, no crunch. Don't do it. Let's go a little lighter. So remember when I told you that the first game I did, I got $10,000. It was great, $10,000. I was a student, I was so happy. And then we got to do a game for Cartoon Network. And I thought, oh boy, Cartoon Network has a lot of money. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna ask for three times as much money. <laughs> so I went to Cartoon Network and I said, 30,000. You know what they said? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so those were the worst negotiations of my life. Um, a few months later, a friend of mine came to me and they said like, hey, we're talking to Cartoon Network, how much money should we ask? I'm like, oh, we said 30. They said, yes, straight away, you should ask for 60. He went there, they said, oh yeah, absolutely. So about four years ago, the guy that I negotiated with left Cartoon Network, and I went to him and I said, like, okay, listen, I've been wondering about this for like <laughs> six, seven years now. How much was the average deal you did at Cartoon Network? He was like, oh, 250. <laughs> what? <laughs> 250, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, good did Jeff told me? He's like, no, my boss, was like, that's a good deal, you should take the 30K. <laughs> 250, I could have asked, I, uh, I still get a little upset about this story. Uh, I could have asked for eight times the money and they would have probably gone like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I told you about that business case, it's not because I'm just being a stickler for like, add those numbers, it's because most people can actually pay that. This industry is full of money. As we speak, there are deals being made that are millions of dollars. There are talks being made that are worth, there are, there are deals being made that are a million dollars because somebody misspoke. Because somebody just had a fun game or a funny idea because they were sitting in a restaurant and thinking about something, right? Those deals get made. So when you pitch a game, pitch way more than you think is reasonable. Way more. Triple it. No, no, 10 times it. Because if you're thinking of this as a student, Getting your next meal might be expensive. Thinking about how you're gonna pay for food is expensive. For these companies, $100,000 can be throwaway. So don't worry about it, bitch high. It's easier to go down than to go up. I just wanted to reiterate my crunch point. Fuck it, don't do it. <laughs> so, um, when we think about, I need to hurry up a bit. Uh, when we think about uh, games, we often think about games, but what we are is actually a subsection, subsection of play. And games might be relatively new. Play is the oldest language in the world. It precedes language, it precedes music, it precedes everything. You know how we know that? Because we wouldn't have gotten to those if we hadn't been playful. You know that play is in our DNA. And it's really simple to figure out why. If you were, back in the days when humanity was living amongst predators, if you just decided to climb the tree for the hell of it, Right? Just to see if you could be fast at it. Or if you were throwing rocks at a small target just to hit that target, that's playful, right? You're playing. Now if a predator would show up and they got to eat one of the people in your village, and you happen to be the person that just climbed in that tree all the time, would you be the one that got eaten? Probably not, you should be in the tree. As long as somebody else is slower, they got eaten, right? If you extrapolate that, it's really easy to see that play is just a part of who we are. When I travel, no matter where I go, rich, poor, war, peace, whatever, language, no language, whether I can communicate with them or not, if I put a ball on the ground and I kick it at them, they kick it back. If I have a ball and I throw it at them, they'll try and catch it. It's a universal language. We speak, as game designers, the oldest 
most universal language. With that comes tremendous opportunity because we can speak across borders, we can speak across the language, we can speak to anybody. With that also comes tremendous responsibility. So when we think about games, I think it's important to make sure that we put it in the context of play. And if you haven't read the book uh, Homo Ludens by Heisinger, I'd recommend you read that book. Just for a small cultural context of what we do and what we are, the power that we have and the responsibilities that we have. Now don't forget, I am a guy that made a game about fishing with machine guns. And I'm not trying to preach that you have to make like serious games or anything. I'm trying to tell you that you have to be aware of what you're making. Who here has ever done QA on a project? Who here has a formal QA? We have one formal QA? Wow, cool. Nice. QA is not, I played my game and it didn't crash. And for a lot of students, that is sort of what they expect. QA is a methodological, I don't know how to speak that, English is my first language. What is the word? Methodical? Method methodical. All right. It's a process. <laughs> it's a process that is very precise and it takes a lot of time. It is not something that you just do. It is something that needs to be done in a very specific way to make sure that your game holds up under really weird circumstances. It is replaying the same level in the silliest way possible. It's trying to walk into every wall. It's trying to jump over everything. It's trying to every weird combination of items that might happen. QA is a lot more than just the game doesn't crash, right? So when you do QA properly, there's all sorts of stuff involved. You record your data, you report, you test, you retest, you iterate. There's a lot that goes into it. If you are ever at the point where you're going to do a commercial game and you're going to launch and you have the time or the money to do it, get somebody to do QA. And I say this because I didn't. And boy, was that a mistake. Uh, our first console game had to go through certification. And I think I lost like six months of my life in actual time and also six months of my life just in pure confusion and stress to get through cert the first time. And at the end, somebody just went like, why didn't you just hire a QA agency? It would have been like this amount of money. And I'm like, what? That's not that much compared to like a year of my life. If you ever have the, if you ever at that point, just hire a QA company. It's not a thing you just do. It's the same thing, you don't just make a trainer. Get somebody that knows how to make a trainer unless you're good at trainers. And you know, like make sure you're actually good at trainers, not your best friend says you're good at trainers. Your parents say you're good at traders. You know? Who has ever released a commercial game? How many of you have released it on Steam? When you release a game on Steam, what happens when you press the big green release button at the, start, at the top of the screen? Who here thinks your game releases? <laughs> you all know it's a trick question. When you hit the big green button that says release at the top of the screen of the Steam page, you know what happens? It goes into the review queue. It takes about three to five days to go through. Is that what you want to find out when your game is about to launch in the next five minutes and the press release are going live? It is not the thing you want to find out. Regardless, I can tell you I get about six to 10 emails every month from indies who have made exactly this mistake and need me to reach out to Steam to fix it which I then do, but like, obviously, I would prefer not to. So, you're all now prohibited from sending that email to me. If I get that email from you, I will ignore it. When you are about to release a game on a store that you've not released on before, here's what you do. You email any developer that has done it. You ask them, how does this work? Because there will be weird stuff. There will be weird rules, there will be things you did not agree, uh, did not expect. And it's much better to just ask up front. So if you ever need a question like that, email me. Just send me that email. Or email any developer that you know who's gone through that. We don't bite. We might not answer because we might be busy. They just email somebody else. Somebody will have that answer for you. Somebody will have the time. Please, please don't just wing it. 
If tried, it was a bad idea. You know what? I can tell you all about this, but here's what I'm going to say. Look up Designing for Subway Legibility, which is a talk by Zach Gage. Zach Gage is an incredible designer. He's one of those people that whenever I have a conversation with him, I feel smarter just for having been in the same room. Um, this talk, this, this talk about subway legibility is one of the best things I've ever read about game design. It is about how do you make your game legible in such a way that you won't need tutorialization? How do you make it legible in such a way that somebody who watches your game will understand what it means, but also allow depth in that? This is one of the best talks you will ever, ever uh, read on game design. Triage is a fun word. Uh, triage is, who, who knows your triage besides Lisa Brown? Good. So triage is basically trying, is, is a function of fixing things that is based on necessity, severity, and uh, resource availability. It's basically trying to figure out what your priorities are in fixing things. Now, like with most things in video games, there is not a proper answer to this question. There's not a right way of doing it. What there is, though, is an agreement between a team of what this process is. So here's a question. You are releasing a game, and the day before launch, which is too late, you should have done QA, but the day before launch, you find that there are two bugs in the game. The one bug occurs at about 99% of players, and it's a minor, small annoyance, but it's definitely annoying. The other bug occurs in 0.0001% of players, but it formats your hard drive. Which one do you fix? Do you? I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not, I don't have a right answer to this. I mean, it depends on how many people are going to download my game. If I think 12 people are going to download my game, I don't know. If a million people are downloading my game, like, oh, yeah, I'm fixing the format bug. 0.00001% is pretty low. Now, this is a pretty extreme example. In reality, it's not going to be quite as clear cut. It's not going to be quite as big, quite as extreme. Regardless, as a team, the last thing you want is to spend that day before launch arguing about which bug you should fix. So before you get to that point, make rules on what your priorities are. Are we going to fix based on severity? Are we going to, based, uh, are we going to fix based on resource availability? Are we going to fix on necessity? Right? Are we going to fix based on how often a bug happens and or how severe it is? If you have rules in place, this will be a much easier discussion. You might even have time to fix one and a half. Maybe it won't format the hard drive. It'll only delete the documents folder or something. Here is a UX designer. Who, here, who is good at UX? <laughs> here, here's, here's the actual reality of UX. Most people suck at UX. I thought I was good at UX, and then I made the Lufthrauses interface. And boy, do I suck at UX. It's a really bad, it's a really bad interface. <laughs> we thought it was real cool. It was like a submarine that like rotated it. Nobody understood it. Um, the trick of UX is that a lot of it is about flow. A lot of it is about leading the player to where they need to go. That is about as far as you will get as a non-UX UX designer. If you're not somebody who has really, really looked into this, really understood it, really under, looked at like, the different inputs, outputs, feedback, data that you collect for UX, probably don't want to be your, your own UX designer. If you have nobody else, sure, fair enough. Uh, if you do, please, please just get somebody to look at it and do it right. Uh, bad UX will kill your game, like a bad store page will kill your game. So uh, UX is not something that you just do. It's something that takes a lot of time. It's something that takes a lot of effort. And like your store page, it is the thing that people will break away from your game from. Y'all know the phrase vertical slice? Yeah, what's the vertical slice? Yeah, keyword finished slice. There's two ways of getting to, getting to show what your game is gonna be. The first one is a prototype, which is a small, simple version of the core mechanics or core feeling of the game that works. A vertical slice is a finished slice of your game. When you pitch to a publisher, you probably want that. Prototype helps. 
and some publishers will take prototype. Vertical slice will not only prove that you have an idea that could work, it also proves that you've gone through the process of doing it. It shows that you can hit this art level that you set. It shows that you have made the pipeline to get to that point. And if you have a budget for how long that vertical slice took in terms of time, in terms of money, that'll be even better. These are things that publishers love to hear. We have a vertical slice, took three months to make. We know that this was your first attempt at making this. So now that making another one of this vertical slice will be faster. It'll be faster than three months. It'll cost less money than those three months, right? Make a vertical slice. If you ever get to the point where you want to pitch something, just focus on that. Finished. It looks exactly like you want it. And you can fake a bunch of shit, right? It doesn't have to be exactly right. But it should give the experience as it should be. If you're a team, you've probably never thought about your work culture. Let me tell you, you have a work culture. The work culture will probably not be obvious to you until you ever have to hire somebody. When you hire somebody, you're going to realize this person does not fit. This person has a different attitude. This person doesn't gel with the way we work. Work culture is something that is invisible. It is extremely powerful. And if you don't manage it, it can be insidious. It can be dangerous. And it can lock your team into patterns that are toxic or that are harmful to other people in your team. So when you are a team that is going to work together for extended periods of time, have a sit down, talk about your work culture. What are your values? What does your team want to be? What kind of perspectives do you want represented? And this sounds like not a big deal when you're a student, but let me tell you that most studios, including my own, started with a bunch of students. They just decided to work together, and oh shit, we're a company now. And for a lot of us, that continues into, oh shit, we're hiring a person now. So when you are that small student team, and you're looking at maybe, in the future, being a commercial studio, there's two things I want you to very carefully consider. The first one sounds a little mean, but you're probably five people. You probably only need three. So when you're a team of five, and two of them are, and three of them are artists, do you need three artists? It's a discussion that you're going to have at some point. You can have it at the start of things when you're still friends and don't have a lot of like stake going in. But if you're going to be five people, you have to feed five people, and you're a company now. You want to be a company. If you want to be a company, make sure you do it in a way that's sustainable. You can give, you can try and give five people a job, and you'll probably fail. You can try and give three people a job, you'll also probably fail, but a little less likely, because you're only paying for three instead of five. If you can fund five, keep five. If you have a publisher that will pay for it, keep five. If not, have a sit down and chat through this. Because one of the hardest things you'll do as a company is always related to people. People always think it's like the next game idea. Oh no, it must be negotiating. It's, no, no, the hardest, the hardest part of running a company is your team is the people, because they're people. People are messy, they're complicated, they're weird, they have feelings. You have to talk. You have to be honest. You have to create ways to be honest. And that is part of your work culture. Part of your work culture is how do you deal with difficult questions? Do you shut up, leave them faster? Do you talk about it? So when people ask me what is the most important skill in this industry, it's never whether they can program. You can hire a thousand programmers. I want a good programmer, in this room, it's probably 20, 30 pretty good programmers. Artists, probably 20, 30 pretty good artists. Designers, can find those here, can find them anywhere, right? Musicians, I get 100 emails a day. Somebody that's like a nice human, it's a lot harder. Somebody who talks, who's honest, vulnerable, will discuss things, will let me know when I'm fucking up, that's hard. If you ever want to develop one skill to make it in this games industry, develop that one. The other ones, if you're good enough, you're good enough, right? Doesn't mean don't, don't hone those skills, hone those skills. But hone being a good person, first and foremost. Who here loves Excel? <laughs> Out. <laughs> Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets will be your best friend, and you will hate them, but they'll still be your best friend. Uh, they are some of the best ways 
of organizing information, of figuring out how certain balances work, of figuring out algorithms, of figuring out balance, uh, I already said balances. Uh, basically anything related to storing information or numbers, spreadsheets are great. If you do not love them, learn to love them because you're gonna be using them in this industry. Here's your nose to Yomi. I just need to, I just need, except for Lisa, for all the, no. it's okay. Yomi is, uh, it's actually a card game. And it's a pretty good card game. But the basic idea of Yomi is that it turned into a design term. And the design term is very simple. It is, I think that you think. That's one level of Yomi. You can do two levels of Yomi. It is that I think that you think that I think. You can do three, four, or five. You can design your game around that. If you're ever making a game that is multiplayer, you are thinking about Yomi. And if you're not, you're probably not making a very interesting multiplayer game. Yomi, though, is not just something you use in multiplayer. You can also use it in AI. In Nuclear Throne, we have a few fun examples. In Nuclear Throne, in the first level, enemies will actually aim away from you. That's actually a feel thing. They will never aim at you. You know why we don't want the enemies aiming at you? Because you might die. And we don't want you to die in 1-1. One, one. We want you to feel good in 1-1. One, one. So we don't aim at you. Because if you die in 1-1, one, one, you might think the game sucks. So 1-1, one, one, we'll give it to you. 1-2, they aim a little better. 1-3, that's when they start aiming at you. But by then, you already feel like you can play the game. Like I said, we don't have to design for the game to be fair. We just have to make sure it feels fair to you. In Lift Rousers, Enemies actually start aiming more accurately as the game goes on. But at the start, you have to fly into those bullets. You have to suck pretty bad <laughs> to get a hit of lift rousers. Is that fair? No, hell no. Does it feel cool? Yeah, it's a game about being the best fighter pilot in the world. That's all that matters, right? Our enemies in Nuclear Throne mostly have no Yomi. There's one enemy in particular that has a little bit of Yomi. They're called the Assassins, and they're generally understood to be the biggest assholes in the game. That's why we made them. We wanted to have one enemy type that made you go like, oh shit, I have to think ahead. Letting enemies aim at where you're moving is a very simple way of adding a little bit of thinking. Oh, the enemy's gonna aim there, so I should do this, right? It's already more interesting than just, oh, this bullet is coming my way. So Yomi is not just something you do in single player games, uh, not just something you do in multiplayer games, you also do it in single player games. Make patterns where the player has to think, oh, I think I'm gonna do this, so the enemy is gonna do that, so I should do this. Very simple way of making your game so much more interesting. Does everybody know the phrase zero sum? Okay, well, zero sum is one of those things that sounds very simple. If, if one person wins, everybody else loses. Um, there is, however, it, I find it a very good start of the rabbit hole into game design theory. So if you don't have, if you've never went on Wikipedia and just got lost in the entire history of game design theory, start at that and just click at every weird phrase that you see. Uh, whether it's like economic theory or a Pareto effect or like whatever, like there's, there's millions of phrases that you can look at that are related to game design that you probably haven't heard of. Look them up. Uh, and then you will come across a number of books uh, by Eric Zimmerman, by Raf Koster, by Steve Swing, um, buy those books and read them, even if you're not a designer. Uh, this industry is incredibly multidisciplinary, and like I said earlier, knowing how to speak each other's language is incredibly valuable. So if you're not an artist, draw a bit. If you're not a musician, make some music. If you're not a programmer, try some code. If you're not a designer, learn about design. Now, this is where the alphabet ends, but I have one more slide for you. Does anybody have any questions? All right. So this is my final slide for you. I am, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in the games industry, but I've been around for 10 years. How many of you have been around for 10 years? Except for Lisa. <laughs> if there's somebody on a stage that tells you you could ask them a question, and they've been in the industry for about 10 times as long as you have, you should ask that question. I don't care what the question is. I don't care whether it sounds dumb, whether you think it's not important, whether it matters. It's your question. All of you have questions. There's not a single person in this room that does not have a question. 
You know what you have? A hang up against asking that question. When somebody tells you you could pitch a game, you should pitch your game, even if you do the shittiest pitch of your life, even if it's the worst pitch, even if you've not prepared. If you have an opportunity to ask a question, not you, Jerry, if you have an opportunity to ask a question, ask the question. And I know it might be scary, and I know it might be overwhelming, and I know that all these other people are here. But if you have the opportunity, do it. Because it's not going to come again, necessarily. Right? I'll, I'll ask for questions in a sec. Uh, so I do not believe there is a single person in this room that does not have a question. I believe that there's a lot of people in this room who did not want or dare to ask that question. You know what, if you don't want to ask that question, that's fine too. But I don't believe that there were that many people in this room that really didn't want to ask the question. I believe there's a lot of you in this room that wanted to ask the question but didn't dare to. So I'm gonna ask again. For all of you that have a question, raise your hand if you have a question. Really? Nobody else have a question. No, it didn't. This is always what happens. What did I say about failure? It's literally the way we get better. Your dumb question is still a good question. Your bad question is still a better question than no question. So we're going to go with the questions that are here, but for the future, please keep in mind, ask your question. You. We'll do one. Pick the best one. Oh yeah. Oh boy. So you're basically saying like, I feel incompetent. Yeah. Who here feels incompetent in the games industry? <laughs> okay. If you don't feel incompetent in the games industry, chances are you've not gone very far in the games industry. Uh, the reality is we all feel that way. Uh, it's called imposter syndrome. It's pretty much ubiquitous uh, for anybody uh, that works in a creative field. Again, it's because we don't have any way to measure where we are. Like you say, my progress isn't very fast. You might be going three times as fast as I do. You don't see that though, right? Um, you might listen to somebody talk and you go like, oh, this person knows everything. And they just know like this little slice about that thing. And they're thinking like, oh boy, I only know about this, right? It's like a very common thing. Like we all think everybody knows better. The reality is like we're all just struggling and making shit up as we go. Like 90% of the stock is improvised every time I do it. Like, we all, think, we all think that everybody's about to find out that we're a fraud. It's not how it is. Other question? Yeah. Best tips from time management. Honestly, any type of time management. Write down how much time you're spending on something and keep track of that. The honest reality is that most of us suck at scheduling. Like, uh, how many here believe a programmer's estimate of how long something is going to take? <laughs> you? No? Yeah. I mean, also don't believe how long I say the talk is going to take, clearly. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing, we're all kind of bad at scheduling. Uh, <laughs> so, um, with time management, honestly, any solution is better than no solution. Uh, I don't really have any particular time management. I did Pomodoro to, like, manage my days for a while. Uh, but that was more of a like time management thing than like a, a scheduling tool. Um, I honestly really like working on sort of like a, I like having milestones with specific dates, uh, and then I like giving the team two weeks less than they think they actually have. That's like my one my one thing is I'll give them like enough time and then add two weeks on top of that in my schedule, but not in their schedule so that they have a deadline and then they can be two weeks late and still be on time. Uh, otherwise they end up crunching and I don't like that. Uh, can I do one more?